Hi, and welcome back to English 75A. Uh, today we will be looking at Jonathan Edwards and two of his really important pieces of writing, personal narrative and sinners in the hands of an angry God. Two different pieces um, that come out of the same very sharp mind. Of course, a little biographical information on him. He was the son of a preacher man. Yes, he was. His uh, father was quite uh, well known in Puritan communities, so he was exposed to Puritan theology and uh, the vocation or avocation of being uh, a priest very early on. He attended Yale from 1716 to 1720. If you do the math there, he's born in 03, he's going to Yale, 1716. He was there when he was 13 years old. So, wow. Go Doogie Hauser. The other thing you need to know about him is that uh, as a student, he was extremely focused and diligent. He would get up at about four every morning, study for 13 hours a day, and leave time for some brisk walking and meditation. And in historical circles and in literary historical circles. He's known as being um, the high point of Puritan theology and thinking. Um, he was the most systematic and thoughtful, intellectual, and rigorous in his writing and thinking about uh, Puritan theology. And so he really helped to push that particular doctrine as far as it could go. Uh, you didn't want to get in an argument with him. He was also one of the very uh, famous proponents for the Great Awakening. We talked a little bit about that in the American history uh, and literature slides earlier. Um, I think it was in number two. American Lit 1700 to 1820. Um, he was in some ways recasting the Puritan faith experience and putting a certain physicality, a certain visceralness in this. Um, viscera, is a, visceral, comes from the uh, uh, the Roman, uh, the Latin word for gut. You know, you might have heard of you know viscera, uh, meaning like intestines, those organs around your abdomen area. You might have you might have even heard the word eviscerate before, which means to basically disembowel somebody. There's your idea there. But anyway, religion and ins religious inspiration, spirituality is something you felt in your body. And remember, some of the other more traditional Puritans did not like this part of it. Um, and that leads us to some important points. I'm going to go back one more slide to keep that on there, just so we can talk a little bit about him as a whole. Now, when we get to the personal narrative essay, there are, so, there are a couple things that I'd like you to pay attention to. Personal narrative is really um, all about the story of his uh, awakening and coming back to God again and again. So it's almost like a spiritual journey or a spiritual narrative. So he does talk about how he had trouble with his discipline at certain points and how he had some great um, strides in becoming more pious and more holy. But at a certain point, he says that um, he fell back into his old ways. He returned to his old, less pious, less disciplined ways like a dog returns to its vomit. You know, sometimes you see dogs even throw up. So that's in there. Um, and that too is a very visceral image, right? Now I'm changing the view here a little bit just so you can kind of maybe stare at me instead of looking at Jonathan Edwards uh, while I talk about a few passages here. Hopefully, hopefully that's an improvement. Um, no guarantees. One of the things about uh, Jonathan Edwards language that I think is worth noting is that there are points at which that he creates oppositions 
in a way that don't seem to make sense and seem to transcend uh, uh, what we would see as a logical way of looking at things. If you go to page 360, the second full paragraph is going to start not long after I first began to experience these things. Um, so he's talking about how he's walking alone. Um, and towards the end of that paragraph, he talks about being inspired by God. And he's, he says to him, he says that this is the experience he had. That sentence starts, and as I was walking there and looked up on the sky and, and uh, clouds, there came into my mind a sweet sense of the glorious majesty and grace of God that I know not how to express. You know, it's beyond words, he's saying, right? He, but he's still using words. He's giving it a shot. I seemed to see them both in a sweet conjunction, majesty and meekness joined together. It was a sweet and gentle and holy majesty and also a majestic meekness, an awful sweetness, a high and great and holy gentleness. So if you think about how these words contrast, with each other, uh, it's it's a bit of a brain twister. Um, uh, meekness is another word for you know humility. Um, so how can something be majestic and humble at the same time? Um, they're both powerful qualities, I think, and they're both admirable qualities. I think most people would agree, but there is a little bit of you know. Uh, a contradiction or a paradox that he's asking us to hold in his mind there. And he goes on and saying, you know, it's a majestic meekness and awful sweetness. Awful back then just meant full of awe or awe-inspiring, so that kind of works. But um, he also says, a high and great holy gentleness. And again, you know, we're talking about a powerful gentleness here. So in some ways, he's really pushing at the edges of how um, people can understand what God is according to their faith, you know, and he's using the language in new and different ways to make that happen. One more point that I will have you think about when it comes to uh, the personal narrative, which again is, you know, it's almost like a coming of age story or a coming of spiritual age story, is on page 362. We're looking at the one, two, three, third full, third full paragraph. Starts about right there. Do, 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 do. Where it begins holiness. Now I want you to listen to this passage and how he's talking about um, being the receiver of holy inspiration. Holiness, as then I then, as I then write down some of my contemplations on it, appeared to me to be of a sweet, pleasant, charming, serene, calm nature. Almost feels like Zen in a way, right? You know, um, that sense of calmness. Um, it seemed to me it brought an inexpressible purity, brightness, peacefulness, and ravishment of the soul and that it made the soul like a field or garden of God with all manner of pleasant flowers. That is all pleasant, delightful, and undisturbed, enjoying a sweet calm and the gentle vivifying beams of the sun. The soul of true Christian, as I then wrote my meditations, appeared like such a little white flower. As we, were, as we see in the spring of the year, low and humble in the ground, opening its bosom, to receive the pleasant beams of the sun's glory, rejoicing, as it were, in a calm rapture, diffusing around a sweet fragrance, standing peacefully and lovingly in the midst of other flowers round about, all in manner, opening their bosoms to drink in the light of the sun. Well, he's talking about, you know, how this holiness is coming to him, right? But very early on, he's talking about purity, but he's also talking about ravishment. To be ravaged is to be um, taken and kind, kind of uh, consumed uh, in uh, a physical and sensual way. And how, how can a ravishment be pure? Again, we've got this interesting uh, contradiction happening right there. 
and he cons and he considers himself to be like one of these flowers. I appear like such a little white flower opening its bosom. And again, we've got this really sensual imagery here, a flower opening its bosom. It borders on the sexual, and you could certainly say that there is some kind of physicality in it that is uh, ecstatic. Um, and it's almost as if the holiness, um, his conception of God is ravishing and taking him as if he is being, uh, he is being uh, used or portrayed as an object of spiritual desire, but also feels like sexual desire the same way. So that's an that's a real strong sense of sensuality and, and physicality to be putting in something, uh, especially a Puritan uh, line of thinking at this time. So it's a really interesting take for uh, Edwards to have at that point. And this physicality, this viscerality, I mean, which is rapturous and almost sexy in some ways, um, is something that we'll see altered in a different way when we talk about sinners in the hands of, the, of an angry God. The one last thing I'll say about it is he portrays himself as a flower opening its bosom. I think we're all fairly aware that the word bosom in general refers to like chest, uh, uh, more often than not, uh, the female chest, the breast area, um, and that um, the word flower itself has connotations of sensuality and sexuality as well. Um, for example, uh, to deflower or to commit somebody or to commit defloration means to take somebody's virginity. You're taking, taking away their flower is taking away their virginity. So there we have that parallel well, parallel as well too. So lots to think about there. Again, this is not your average old school Puritan thought piece. This is a new recasting of Puritan thought in a very visceral, um, sensual, bordering, bordering on sexual kind of way. Let me give the pause. Now, some of you might be thinking, um, wow, this relationship between the physical body, the sensual nature of human beings, even the sexual nature of human beings, um, uh, and religion and God and spirituality, this is way off base. This isn't, this isn't, you know, a real thing. What was he thinking? But there has been a long standing tradition of these kinds of associations. Uh, keep in mind that some of uh, the most uh, physical and sensual works of Renaissance painting and Renaissance uh, sculpture are representations from the Old Testament or the New Testament, from religion. And that's the only way they were able to justify being able to show nude forms or practically nude forms. Um, and there is a sensuality that's built into some of those. I don't know if you've ever seen pictures of St. Sebastian when he's getting pierced by arrows. Some of it's downright sensual. And I've got a really famous work here that I'd like you to think about too. This is called The Ecstasy of St. Teresa by Gian Lorenzo Bernini in 1652. And the story of St. Teresa is that um, she was not feeling engaged with God or connected with God. And an angel came down from the heaven and pierced her bosom with these arrows of light. It sounds really similar, doesn't it? it sounds super, super similar to what Jonathan Edwards was talking about. And it's a lovely statue. If you ever get a chance to see it in this little chapel in Rome, it is fantastic. It's so worth it. It's a gorgeous work of art. And yeah, I mean, is she praying right now? Um, there's real fine, there's a real fine line between pleasure and pain or spirituality and physicality or sensuality. Uh, in religion. I mean, look at that face. Um, 
that's a whole lot of religion she's going through right there. And it's really 